Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem as far from land as possible. We're given an n by n square grid. It only contains zeros and ones where zeros will represent water and ones will represent land. Now what they're asking for is a tiny bit confusing, so let's go over that. Let's take this grid for example, let's just rebuild the one they have down here. So we'll put land pieces in the four corners and the rest of it will be water. So among all of these water cells, we want to find the closest island to this water, the closest land to this water. For this one, how far away is it from the closest piece of land? Well, it could be either this one or this one, and it's a distance one. So let's mark that. Same for this one, this one, and this one. Each of them is one uh, square away from land. So each of them we say is one distance away from land. Now. Well, it gets interesting with this middle one. You could say it's one from land if we go diagonally, but that's not how we calculate the distance. We're using Manhattan distance, which is the difference in horizontal and the difference in vertical. So we have to go one, two spots for this one to reach this position, or it could reach any of these four as well. But the point is that this is two squares away from the closest piece of land. So this is what we want to do. Get the closest piece of land for all of the water grids. Now, among all of these five, we want to look at all of these distances, find the maximum, and then return that. So in this case, two is the maximum. So our return value in this case would be two, because what we're doing here is finding the water grid that's farthest away from land as possible, just as the name of the problem implies. So how exactly can we accomplish this? Well, pretty much just as I showed, except we're gonna do this in sort of a reverse way. Instead of running an algorithm on each of the water cells, for example, this water cell to find the farthest piece of land from it, this water cell to find the closest piece of land to it, we could run like a breadth first search, but we'd have to do that for every one of these zeros we'd have to run a breadth first search on it. Breadth first search on a grid like this is in the worst case gonna be n squared, where in this case, n is one of the dimensions of this square grid. So we'd have to traverse the entire grid. So that's the runtime of BFS, but we'd have to do it for possibly every uh, square in this grid. So it'd be even a less efficient, it'd be n squared for the number of squares in the grid times n squared, which is the runtime of breadth first search. So not very efficient if we do it that way, but there's a clever way we can do it. It's called multi-source breadth first search, where we don't start with a single source, we start with multiple sources. And we do it in reverse, meaning we actually start at all of the land pieces. And for those land pieces, we want to run breadth first search because every time we reach a piece of water, we say that we have found the closest island or piece of land to this water. So what we would do here is we'd add all of these to our queue. That's how breadth first search works. We start with a queue and we'd add all the pieces of land and then we'd run breadth first search on those pieces of land. So for this guy, for example, we'd check its neighbors. So these two, and we'd say, okay, the distance, the closest piece of land to these two is of distance one, because we just started at land here. And then we would try to do that for this guy as well, but we'd look to the left and see that this one has already been visited, so we don't need to uh, do anything with it. And also when we are visiting these, we would add them to our queue because then we're gonna continue to run breadth first search on these. Continuing from this guy, we would just look up and then do the same thing for this guy. And then from here, maybe we would do the same thing for this guy. And then if we tried running breadth first search from here, we'd see that both of its neighbors have already been visited. So there's nothing for us to do at that point. Now these purple squares would be what's added to our queue at this point, and then we'd continue running breadth first search. But maybe we start from this one, we would look here. From here, maybe we'd look in all four directions. But remember, if we go out of bounds in any of these directions, we don't wanna continue our breadth first search, so that's just something we'll have to check for. 
And how exactly are we going to keep track of not visiting the same position twice? We could have a hash set to mark these positions as visited or unvisited. That would definitely work. If we're allowed to modify the input grid, maybe we can just mark the values. So for example, when we started at these four ones, we kind of already considered them visited because they're land anyway. But then when we visit these zeros, we can mark them visited by keeping track of their distance. So instead of this value being a zero, we can overwrite it with a one. Now, the way we're actually going to do this is just taking the source value and adding one to it. So in actuality, we'd say this is one and then we'd add one to get the value that we'd put here, which is two. We saw that we had visited these four positions and then finally one of them would end up visiting the center position, which if these grids have a value of two, the value that would go in the center would be three. Now this algorithm works to find the distance, but we're off by one because we set these land pieces to initially be a value of one when they should have actually been a value of zero, but we kept them as being one just because we don't want to keep track of like another hash set. We can just use the grid to mark cells as visited by marking them with their distance. So the last value, the last cell that we visit will be the one that we want to return always. Because remember, among all of these cells, we want to return the one that is farthest from land, where the distance is maximized. So it will be the last one that we visit. That will be the one that we return. But we just have to subtract one from the value. Because right now it's three. We'll subtract one and then return two. So that's the exact result that we will get. Now there's one last edge case we have to worry about. What if we have all land in our grid or if we have all water? In that case, we should return a default value of negative one because it won't be possible for us to even find the distance that we're trying to compute. So that's the problem. It's not quite as complicated as maybe it seems. It's just a multi-source breadth first search. The runtime will be O of n squared. The memory complexity will also be O of n squared in the worst case. So now let's code it up. So the first thing I like to do is just get the dimension of the grid. In this case, it's a square grid, so we can just get the length of it and we'll set that equal to n. Then I'm going to initialize our queue. It's gonna be empty, but for us to populate it, we know we have to get all the pieces of land. So let's do a nested for loop and iterate over the entire grid and then any piece of land that we find so if the grid at this position is equal to one then we can take our queue and append to it this position because it's a piece of land and then over here we're going to actually start running our breadth first search usually while the queue is non-empty we want to pop from the queue so we can do pop left what we will be popping is the coordinates of that piece now let's initialize our result. A good default value to give it would just be negative one, I guess. And every time we pop from the queue, we can go ahead and just update our result because we know the last one that we pop will be the one that will be returned. Now, what value should we assign it to? Well, probably the distance of this position, but where exactly are we storing that? Well, we're just gonna be using the grid for that anyway. So any pieces of land, I guess, will be initialized to one in the grid. So when we do this grid at this coordinate. For the land pieces, we'll be setting this to one, but for all the other pieces, those will be off by one. So when we go ahead and return our result, we want to make sure to subtract one from it. But there's one edge case that I wanna mention now before we forget about it. If we only have land in our grid, then this while loop is going to run because the queue is going to be initialized, but we don't have water. So it's not really possible for us to return or compute a valid distance, what will end up happening is this result will be set to one because that's what the land pieces are initialized in the grid. And then we'll end up returning one minus one, which is zero. But what we actually want to return in that case is negative one. So we'll return result minus one if our result is greater than one. Otherwise, if it's equal to one, that means it's an invalid answer and we should actually be returning negative one. Now let's fill out the rest of this breadth first search. So for this position, we want to go through all four directions. So let's go ahead and initialize an array that can allow us to do that. So zero, one is one of the directions. One, zero is one of the directions. Uh, zero, negative one and negative one, zero. So this is like a little shortcut we can do instead of writing 
for like statements out explicitly. So we'll say for direction R, direction column in our four directions, we want to compute the new row and new column. So we can take the original row, add DR to it, the original column, add DC to it. Now we do have to make a couple checks before we can take this coordinate and add it to our queue. We have to first check that this is in bounds. So we have to make sure that both of these are greater than or equal to zero. Or in other words, we wanna make sure that the minimum of these is greater than or equal to zero. So we can do it in a shorter statement like this. And we wanna make sure neither of them goes out of bounds. Since this is a square grid, both of them will have a maximum possible value of n minus one if they're gonna be in bounds. So if they're greater than n minus one, then that means they have gone out of bounds. So let's make sure that they are less than n minus one. So we take the maximum of both of them and make sure that it is less than, less than or equal, I think, to n minus one. Or we could just say less than n. Now, there's one other thing that we have to check for, and that is that the piece that we're position or that we're visiting right now, the coordinate that we're visiting is a piece of water. So we'll check that grid at this position is equal to water. We could just say it's equal to zero, or we could take the negation of that. Either one will work. So just gonna wrap these in some parentheses. Now, if this is the case, that means if it's in bounds and it's a piece of water, then we want to add it to the queue. We can say queue.append this new row and this new column. Whoops, I forgot up here when we're checking if it's a piece of water, we're not checking the source, we're checking the new row and new column. I have to fix it before I forget. And the last thing that we want to do when we add it to the queue is also mark the distance of it. Remember, we're doing that inside of the grid. So we'll say new row at this new column. The distance is going to be the distance of the source position. How do we get that? Well, that's also going to be stored in the grid. So this row grid plus one because the shortest distance to reach this position was stored here. So now the shortest distance to reach this position is gonna be stored with the original value plus one here. And that is pretty much the entire code. So now let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes it does, and it's pretty efficient. If this was helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. It has a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon.